Good evening. Welcome to what I know you're going to find uh, to be a very special experience as you meet our five guests, all of whom are part of our current Birds of a Feather art gallery exhibit, which just opened in the gallery at Yuba Center Arts and Culture in Marysville. I'm David Reed, Executive Director of Yuba Center Arts and Culture. So what's this show all about? Birds of a Feather features the post-contact utilitarian artistry of Jerry Piconum, alongside Mia Marufo, Shante Parks, Kyla Pena, and Jamie Lanouette. All are contemporary cultural artists who share a commitment to the preservation of traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. TEK forms the basis of seasonal practices that affirm the intergenerational relationships of the animals, the plants, and the people. The works on display in our gallery embody the gifts of the land and the artist's transformative labor. This gathering of individuals ranging from emerging artists to well-known practitioners provides a glimpse into the tribal landscapes of the region and the active connections that have been maintained for millennia. From pre and post contact utilitarian tools, garments, adornment and regalia to contemporary digital illustrations, this exhibition offers a unique opportunity to appreciate the depth of relationship of the artists to their materials and to each other. Not only do the artists have in common their active ancestral ties to the land, but as students and teachers, they're also connected through their contributions to the continuous flowering of contemporary cultural arts in the region. So what about the show name? I think Jeremy said it best when he wrote, as native California Indian artists, we chose the title of this art show carefully to express the internal connection all California native Indians have with our environment and traditional lands. Although we have many distinct cultural differences in dialects within California, one thing remains constant and true. As California natives, we are all interconnected, not just through genetics, but spiritually with our generational connection to Mother Earth. So in essence, we are all feathers from the same bird. Thank you, Jeremy. A couple of big thank yous. Uh, Birds of a Feather at Yuba Center Arts and Culture was curated by Mia Marufo for Concept Art Plus Movement, a project of arts and culture, El Dorado. Sigrid Benson was also a great contributor to the show. We also give thanks to our friend Terry Lamanchek, Executive Director of Arts and Culture, El Dorado, for supporting this project. A couple of us saw the show back in May and were just blown away. And thanks for making the introductions to Sigrid and the artists and helping make this exhibition possible. Sigrid, uh, could I get you to talk a little bit about the creation of the incubator and some of the upcoming shows that uh, you have planned? Yeah, sure. It's a pleasure. My name is Sigrid Benson, and my role here is to facilitate art shows for concept art and movement. As you mentioned, um, we are a California native art incubator with a focus on cultural and curatorial arts. Um, the group is artist-led and community-centered. Um, and we're really here to support California Indian, Native American, and indigenous arts and curation through community-centered contemporary art exhibits, such as the one that we're um, speaking to today, as well as professional development workshops and educational programming. We are run by a community curator circle that includes Shante Parks and Mio Marufo, both in as well as Melissa Malero and Gemma Benton. Um, and we are um, looking forward to following this wonderful venue up with a showing at the Museum of Northern California Art in Chico that will be opening up um, on December 2nd of this year and running through the end of January. So we encourage everyone to, you know, come see the show at Yuba Sutter Arts and then keep in touch. Um, we can always be reached at um, cam.culturalarts at gmail dot com if you would like to get onto our email distribution. Fantastic. Thank you, Sigrid. All right, let's get on with the show. I'd like to start with each of you uh, introducing yourselves and, and sharing uh, a little bit about your background, what inspired you to get involved with these unique art forms. You know, so take a couple of minutes and uh, uh, let's, uh, Jeremy, shall we start with you? Sure. 
Um, thank you for the introductions and thank you for everyone having me. I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Jeremy Pacanum and I'm a Mountain Maidu artist. Um, I specialize in what I lovingly like to joke and refer to as sharp sticks and rocks. But uh, I can tell you right now that uh, it's quite complex. Um, quite often my genre is called utilitarian art or even primitive arts. But uh, as I'm speaking to you now, I can assure you they're anything but primitive. Um, what I have for you in this show, Birds of a Feather, um, a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new. Um, so you will get to see a, a good cross section of traditional pre-contact and post-contact. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. I don't want to take up too much and let too many of the secrets out of the hat while we're doing introductions. Thank you, Jeremy. Akai, do you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Kai Lapina, and I have been basically like doing basically similar stuff for probably 30 years, but I have been dancing traditionally and I grew up in a, like a native upbringing. So while we call it art now, like so much of what I do is difficult for me to think of as art, hmm. but it's, um, at, at, at one time it was just what we do. So, uh, I enjoy what I do and, uh, hopefully everybody out there and in, in also enjoys what I do. <laughs> people, people that see your work will, will vote on the side of it's art. I assure you. So thank you, <laughs> Jamie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Jamie Lanouette. Um, I have been a student of tech, traditional ecological knowledge for, um, about four years now. And, um, I have, been honored to be close to my home in learning all this stuff. So I, I get to gather um, from all my uh, ancestors, traditional village sites. And um, I uh, started with basketry and I'm working my way around learning everything I can. And so I hope you like it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Mio, tell us more. You have so much to share. <laughs> um, so my name is Mio Marufo. I am, I am, uh, I always used to like to say master of none, <laughs> but anyways, um, I, I do, I dabble. I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, I know how to weave, um, the art that's in this show in particular though, is my finger doodles. And, um, that's a uh, it's it's very modern it's uh, multimedia um, but I also do traditional ecological knowledge I also do what we do um, so I started learning uh, about traditional food processing and regalia making uh, when I was probably early teens I started really getting into it I wanted to learn all things pomo um, because I was on a journey to find myself and so I started learning all these different techniques. Um, we didn't live in Pomo territory. We lived in my view and Miwok territory. And so I got to learn from a lot of traditional artists um, from my country, Miwok country and up through Hoopa and Yurok. And so I'm lucky enough to kind of been surrounded by a lot of different gifted artists and picked up things here and there. Um, I, I now live in my homeland of the Clear Lake Basin. And so um, I work with the Clear Lake Basin Pomo as well as uh, the Valley Pomo from over in Mendocino County. So, hi. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's, uh, I'd like to ask a series of questions um, and uh, you're free to respond or not. And, um, and just kind of dig a little deeper into your histories and your work and and maybe even plans for uh, the future, new adventures, um, and new uh, new genres, new types of media. Um, anything else that any of you would like to offer as far as how you got interested in carrying forward, uh, forward these traditional art forms and, and um, uh, 
adding your own perspective to the work? How'd you get started? Uh, sounds like some of you kind of grew up um, with creatives uh, in the community and in your family, but anything else uh, anyone would like to add to that and how you got really got this deeply involved in it? This isn't, the work is not just casual. You, you call your, your work doodles. Uh, I'm here to tell you that this is some kind of high, high level doodling. <laughs> So what, how, how'd you get so deeply involved to, to accomplish so much and, and get to this level of, um, of perfection, if you will? Well, I guess I can start. Um, as a young man, this is how they kept us out of trouble. <laughs> this is how they kept us entertained. And this is how, at least for um, my art, um, it was useful. It was helpful. It was utilitarian. It was helping out. Um, pulling your weight as you could when you were a younger man on the hunting trip on going deer hunting around Eagle Lake and, and things of this nature. And in general, it's how they kept us out of their hair. <laughs> I like it. And look what came out of that, right? So by doing that, yeah, I learned uh, flint napping, tanning hides, sinew work, uh, bone work, antlers, scrimshaw, um, a lot of, a lot of active and robust activities as well as, like Scrimshaw, it's now quiet time. Go sit in the corner. <laughs> and we'll see some examples in a minute, Jeremy, but for those who may not be familiar with the term, uh, describe Scrimshaw. Sure. Um, traditionally, we just refer to it as scratch art. Uh, the modern term, whaling term, uh, 19th century term is Scrimshaw, and it's simply incising or engraving bone or antler and then um, filling that in with a pigment of many different sorts, but it's a way to reveal a design on bone or antler. And uh, this was a traditional method of ornamentation for Mountain Maidu and throughout all California. And that's one of the themes of the show here. And that's one of the things um, I was trying to impress on the show was that even though we're four different tribes here, a lot of the traditional gathering techniques and technologies are universal throughout California. So it doesn't matter if you're Miwok, Pomo, uh, you name it. The only thing that may differ is the material in your area, what you gather, the woods, um, the resources that you have. But the overall construction technology is pretty universal. So it's a good way to see a Maidu spin on Miwok art, a Maidu spin on Pomo art. You know, we're, we're all artists of the same feather here. I like that. That's wonderful. Anyone else want to add an additional comment on how you got interested in carrying these uh, traditional art forms forward or? I'll pop on. Hi, I'll, yeah, please. So uh, my grandfather was a fairly accomplished painter and was fairly well known even in the fine art world. And he went to Indian school so he was taken from his family when wow. he was like six years old. So that would have been like the early fifties. And then he was taken like hundreds of miles away from home and was completely removed from his culture. Then when he was as a young man, when he was actually able to come back to his place, a lot of his elders were gone. And so he took it upon himself to actually go out and find people to learn from people that were still around, you know, hiding in these back corners, you know, like uh, the real Indian, the, uh, the hide and go seek champion of the world, you know, because there's still a few of us left. <laughs> but uh, he so because he took it upon himself to give this to my mother and my uncle and my mother in turn gave it to me. And then I've been dancing traditionally for 30 years and the dance, the songs, the spirit of the land, the idea of living on and with and of the place that you are is it's a, it was given to me and because it is something that is finite and precious, it is something to be, uh, fed and fostered and moved on down the line in perpetuity. 
So it, it's it's a it, it's my joy and my duty to continue the things that I've been taught. That's interesting to to characterize it as a joy and a duty, you know, and uh, that's an amazing story. I, I assume not all young people take it as seriously as you do. They find oh, other, no. other paths. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to, to each their own. You know? Yeah, of course, of course. But uh, thank you. Thank you for carrying forth those traditions. Jamie, would you like to share anything about your involvement in uh, the arts and how you got started? Well, um, I grew up on Shingle Springs Rancheria, but unfortunately, because of how things went in the past, um, we didn't have um, any cultural bearers left. We didn't have any speakers left. Um, so we grew up mostly without it and had to dig it up um, as my generation became adults. And um, so it was a long, slow process, but it's been um, growing really well for the past 10 years. And I got to jump in and be a part of it about four or five years ago. So I just spent as much time as I could in um, reading and at first and then being able to go out um, with our teachers and on the land and learn um, about the plants, about the ways, about basketry. And so um, it's been it's been wonderful. Fantastic. It sounds like there is a lot of self-learning, uh, self-education going on, but also surrounded by some some elders and and others um, in your families that have, have helped kind of nurture your interest in these art mm -hmm. forms. So, mm -hmm. um, Mio, uh, was it was it family that inspired you to go as deep as you have into all of these traditional arts? Um. I guess you could say so. My mom always basically told me, go ahead and do it. You can do it. Um, but my both my mother and father are artists within their own rights. Um, okay. So the love of art in the household has always been there. Um, as far as learning traditional techniques and such, that's probably my own journey just wanting to learn it and wanting to see what it was all about um, to find out what, what it takes to create a piece of art or to create something that is quote unquote historical is also a journey to find out what's in yourself. Um, when, when I first started weaving, my mom would laugh and cause I thought I was doing really bad and she'd laugh and she'd go, no, no, the pomo hands, no. And I was like, you know, I, what is this fortune cookie stuff you're trying to tell me? You know, she said, no, the pomo hands, no. And I go, what does that mean, mom? Deconstruct that for me, would you please? And she's like, she's all, your hands are generational and you have not had it in your, in your hands for two generations. Eventually your hands and your mind will meet and your hands will do what they are supposed to do. So the pomo wow. hands know. And I was like, okay, I can I can I can wrap my mind around yeah. that. And it, it makes a lot of sense. It it does make a lot of sense to me and it does drive, you know, kind of some of the passion, you know, having a mother, of course, I don't have my mother anymore. She's gone now. Mm -hmm. But um, the other people in my life have made it so that I continue with my art forms. You know, they've, they've always pushed and continued. And I'm part of a couple of different really nice groups. Um, we recently started the Pomo Weaver Society, um, Silver Galato and... Um, Corinne Pierce helped start that and they they have been absolute cheerleaders when it comes to revisiting my weaving because I haven't woven in since my mom had gotten sick I stopped weaving and I'm like restarting all these weavings again and I'm like oh man I remember this now you know and and 
you know, pretty soon, you know, we're doing challenges and we're, you know, making little baskets again and, mm. you know, doing, doing little things and, you know, wow. we're pushing each other because the Pomo hands know, no. and they're like, you know what, let's, let's keep this started. Yeah. So, yeah. That sounds like a high praise uh, coming, coming from your mother at that early stage in your career. Always. That kind of, that kind of encouragement. Yeah. That's beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit I completely failed to introduce my colleague, Shante Arroyo, who is <laughs> today. I'm, uh, Shante uh, helps on the technical side of, of many of these programs and, and often appears as a guest host. And so, Shante, thanks for being here today. I'm happy to be here, David, especially with this talk. I'm really excited about this one. This is deeply personal, I know. Yeah. Um, do you want to um, uh, work with Jeremy on the, the next? Uh, we're going to share some images from the show. Sure. So, Shante, take it away. Will do here. So I'm pretty sure this is the one you were, you were referring to, Jeremy. Is that correct? That is correct. That's what I uh, love when we refer to as the bear helmet that looks like a bad 1960s Beatles haircut. <laughs> it does. You can so, see it. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is an example of pre-contact uh, traditional California Indian art. And it's also, of course, utilitarian art because this is art with a purpose. This is functional art. And Jeremy, um, excuse me for interrupting, but would you, I want to, I don't want to dumb this down per se, but would you define pre-contact just in case somebody out there kind of wonders what that means? It's maybe it's, oh, obvious, sure. maybe it's not, but. And, oh, of course. And uh, you're going to be able, if you attend the show uh, virtually or in person, you're going to be able to see pre-contact work, which means pre-European contact. So this is what we uh, refer to as um, back in the free days. So what you're looking at is art with a function, like I was saying. So you're looking at the ornamentation and making everyday items more elaborate and then you start to cross over into different uses for these utilitarian pieces because they are now um, functional works of art these days. But traditionally back then they would change roles from a simple tool into possibly a weapon as you see in front of you. So what you see in front of you is a, and the manufacturer of all these things are a whole different, um, whole different zoom. Uh, I can tell you that the, the sum it up fairly briefly, everything that you see in front of you is done, period. It's done the old fashioned way. I tan my hides, I do my flint napping, I make my paint. Uh, everything is harvested or traded for by someone or traded to back and forth with other people that harvest. And you're also seeing a connection to what the overall theme of one of the overall themes of the art show is and that's a generational connection so the mannequin you see in front of you the items that you see in front of you many of these items are generational gathering and what i mean by that is the suit of body armor that looks like a uh, big turtle shell that the gentleman's wearing the mannequin that is traditional maidu body armor that is stick armor and that particular plant is service berry and that my father started to groom before I was even born so the sticks mm. would grow straight and true to the sun. So when you think wow. of those terms, where you're grooming the forest for the next generation, you're taking care of the forest because the forest is gonna provide for you and you know it's gonna provide for the next generation and you're all linked to survival together, you can start to get a idea of this generational connection that we're talking about in this birds of a feather show. So that suit of body armor is about 22 to 24 years in the making from the mm -hmm. time that uh, my father started trimming it till the time I harvested it and sewed it all together. Um, so that is a good example of something that you'll see in the, the show that you'll probably never see again, because as we all know, suits of body armor like this fell out of fashion very quickly after European contact because what you're seeing is designed for aero defense and not bullet defense. So this particular item you see, you'll probably never see again. There's very, I don't know of anyone that still makes it. My family still does. 
I know that UC Berkeley, the Smithsonian DC, Oakland, there's a few period sets that are in tatters that are in collections of museums, but this is probably the only functional set that you'll ever see. So that is just one of the items on that mannequin that you'll see, but I don't want to uh, take up all the time. Um, maybe someone else can speak about one of their pieces. And if we make it back around, I'll have you pull up another picture for us. All right. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, actually, to kind of go along with, with this, uh, Jeremy, this is a question for all of you. Um, when you are, are creating your art, who is the audience you're creating for? You know, is it specifically, uh, you know, indigenous native people or are you also catering to other people outside that sphere? Well, for myself in, well, there's many different audiences, forms or fashion. As Kai was talking uh, about earlier, my particular audience is no longer here. Um, they've all passed on. So I am carrying on a tradition that was taught to be, I'm a bad stereotype. My grandfather taught my father that taught me. I was lucky enough to have my grandfather in my life until my late teens or so. And uh, he was born back in, Oh, um, 1905, I believe. Might be, I, I, I'm getting old. I can't remember dates. Um, so my audience is my ancestors that are no longer with me, the people that taught me that are no longer with me. And then my other audience is the whole wide world because uh, I want to share this. It was shared with me and I don't want it to, uh, to go away as Kai was speaking about. So my audience is anyone and everyone that's interested in uh, this old timey, um, old timey stuff we got here. Old timey, yeah, mm. truly. Um, Mia, please. Um, my audience. It depends on what piece it is. So um, there are certain pieces that are just. I drew them for me, just for my own pleasure, just to pull out what I was feeling inside. And then there's other pieces that talk about specific materials in our basketry or what our basketry. So this this particular one. Um, is this one of your doodles? This is one of my finger doodles, yes. <laughs> like I, I said, them, yeah, some I doodle. I guess I better tell you why I call them finger doodles, right? Um, I call them figure doodles because I draw them on my phone. It's a free sketch app that I use, really? and I draw them with my finger on my phone. Unbelievable. Um, but so this one is called Lightning Pattern, and it is actually the lightning bolt design in for uh, Lake right. County Pomo. And I drew, I started drawing these. Um, birds and baskets because I drew one and I started getting these questions on where the designs come from, what's the origin of the designs, what feathers are we using. Um, and so I started drawing the birds that we use and the feathers that we use and then start drawing the different types of designs. And I start deconstructing the baskets and talking in particular about the designs. So, so this one here, um, I always mark them as finger doodles. Um, that's just because it's easier to find on Facebook. If you put my name in and then you're in my page and you type finger doodle, all of my drawings will come up. And mm. so it says, there's a change in the weather and the rain. Tonight, a Western tanager watches the lightning and sits upon a basket with the lightning design. Mm. So the Western Tanager, we use some of those feathers also, but this of course doesn't have any feather. It's not a feather basket, right. but it does have the lightning design. So the deconstructed baskets are made for people that are interested in the origins of our basket designs and that are interested in what types of materials or birds that we use. Fantastic. Hmm. I, yeah, um, Mio's um, contribution to the show in the gallery are a series of, of bird-related um, images, doodles, if you will, and, and they're just magnificent. So you'll have to come by to see the rest of them. Um, 
Kai or Jamie, any uh, anything else to add on? On that subject, what was the question again? <laughs> well, who's your audience? Oh, who's my audience? Who are you? Yeah, who are you? Who are you playing to? Uh, I mean, just as Mio said, you know, like it really depends on what it is, but mostly what I like to do is, I mean, my main thing that I do is feather regalia usually, yeah. but. Also, and and mostly it's 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 for us. It's for folks that are going to yeah. use it because I don't really like like if I'm building regalia, I don't really like anything that's going to just sit on a shelf. And you're not building to sell per se, right? No, not 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 per se. I mean, I would hope that everything gets used, but also there is. I do make things that will never get danced, and it's because there's so many objects that are in museum collections. Yes. And for our, like, yeah, they're originals. And so for our thought process, that belongs to someone who is gone. Okay. And so it needs to go back in the dirt. It needs to go, it needs to go home, just like somebody that used it did. Yes. But for the scientific side of it, people like to see it. Mm -hmm. And so for that, like, I, I enjoy making things new to replace things that are in museum collections to allow the repatriation of objects so that those can go back to the tribes, that those can go back to the earth, back to the people that they belong to. And then there's still an object to sit on a shelf or in a display case for people to see technique, materials, usage, but then the old objects can go home. That, that really helps me with that perspective. I mean, I have never heard anyone say that. And I had a friend back east, a tribal member who, who made museum quality um, art as well. And, but that whole idea of being able to repatriate objects in collections inappropriately, and yet, and yet still, like you said, for scientific purposes, for, for sharing the cultural and the, and the ideas, to be able to replace it then with a modern day spot on accurate reproduction is really kind of cool that's that's neat that's a neat perspective here, yeah. here well while i'm on that about uh quality reproductions i mean like 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 see this this is a woven head net okay it, it's made out of dog bane fibers that they call indian hemp okay. this, took, this took 42 hours <laughs> of, of rolling and gathering and tying into a net it's 110 feet of string Wow. And wow. this and this would be worn by one man <laughs> during a dance. So basically, like for a lot of us, a lot of tribes, like our dancers, we have four male dancers. Okay, well yeah. then we need four of these. Oh <laughs> so God. we're talking forty two hours wow. of time. And, and you're doing it you're doing it the old fashioned way, right? I mean that's just how it was done and it's yeah. no problem. It only took forty two hours. Not yeah, right. Long. I know. Piece of cake, right? Came in a kit, right? <laughs> so yeah, the, the the kit the kit is out there growing. Yeah. Just go get it. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's incredible. Well, thanks. That's that's just really sheds a light for me because I'm I'm part of a levy district. Every once in a while, we come upon a you know a, a historic site and the rep repatriation of and God forbid you get into remains, human remains, and mm. it's so sensitive and such critical work. And then. But at least to be able to have the objects um, and these modern day reproductions available for just to just to peak interest to keep people connected to you know what's going on before whether they're tribal or not so that's uh, that's important work um, fantastic Shante you got another one queued up that you want to ask or you're uh, you're uh, muted. Look at that, I did the thing that I warned everyone else about. <laughs> all right. It happens, right? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask actually about how you all acquire the material for your work. Um, I know that uh, Jeremy mentioned uh, trading. Uh, how about everyone else here? <laughs> Verizon. No, just to... <laughs> uh, eBay. It's not eBay, right? Uh, I mean, it's, 
a lot of the stuff that I usually do isn't like I didn't end up putting quite as much of the feather things in this show as I had in the one at Placerville because was that sun, was that bur uh, burst sunburst feather burst was that yours uh the flicker band maybe uh, the, the flicker band yeah oh the top knot yeah yeah yeah, yeah on on the lady mannequin yeah, yeah so so the feathers that I use none of them are dyed or like really altered and I mean I'll cut them and things like that but they're not dyed or painted so I use native species and like most of the native well actually all of the native birds in North America are protected under the Migratory Bird Act of like 1920 or something but so there's 215 species that are protected under federal law not just the eagle you know everybody knows that eagles are protected mm -hmm. but all species of bird in North America are technically migratory so they're protected so you can't legally shoot them so basically all the feathers that I get come from the side of the highway really wow really wow. and things like I don't know if anybody in your audience or yourselves have you ever seen like a California style flicker band it's like oh, orange, yeah. like that okay so those are feathers of a type of woodpecker called the northern flicker and it takes 20 whole birds wings and tails to make one more of the story don't go on road trips with kai it's a bumpy <laughs> ride <laughs> Oh, that goes for all of us. I can't, I can't, I can't like <laughs> pick up red tail hawks and flicker birds at Walmart. I got to drive thousands of road miles to find them. Yeah. Is that, isn't that one of them? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. yeah. There it is. Wow. from the show in El Dorado, at El Dorado. That's it right called. there. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that flicker I, I, band right there is 487 feathers. I have to admit, you know, I, I don't claim any artistry of, on your level, but I have been known to pull over and harvest a, a hawk wing or two or a tail or barn owl feathers. And that's what nice. you do when you, when you love it, you know, when you love that stuff. And then what you do with it, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. Is it all right for me to send, send them your way if I find any? Happily. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy going, oh my God, there's an otter or a, a raccoon, by the way. Uh, oh my gosh. Fur is always so difficult. <laughs> Just a, a note on basketry too. Um, so um, when you see a coiled basket, mostly most of the time it's coiled with sedge root. Um, digging that is um, it takes time. Oh, um, it's sedge! It's root. It's not the outgrowth. It's actually oh my god. Yeah, and so you need to find the plant, dig down to the rhizome. And you need to follow it all the way back to the end. You're trying to find the end of it. So it's, and you don't want to break it off. You want to find the end and then rebury the rest of the plant so that it can keep growing. Um, it's a process. Uh, if you're lucky enough to find it in, in sand, much easier. Um, um, so, so finding those patches and then tending those patches so you get those long, um, roots and then you, and then there's a lot of trimming involved before you're actually ready to weave it into a basket so um just with everything that we do there's so much involved from you know finding the best material to tending the plants to um trimming and taking care of the materials and then and then actually creating um what you see there um in the gallery so Fantastic. Yeah, I didn't realize it was uh, uh, the root. I'm always thinking you're out cutting down something that's growing above the ground. So that, boy, adds to the adventure. I, I won't even ask where the mountain lion skin came from or the otter pelts or any of the other uh, amazing... Roadkill. Um, roadkill. <laughs> roadkill. Oh, oh, it is roadkill, definitely. I wish I could find a mountain lion by the side of the road. I mean, I'd be out there in a heartbeat, I'm here to tell you. <clears throat> My dad was a taxidermist, so I've got skills with a knife and, you know, cool. yeah. you know, anyway, yeah. um, 
You want to look at some uh, scratch work? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, well, sure. Let me let me pull that on up. Let's look at that's that's a yeah. One of, that, one of the many. That's a good example as well. That uh, what we're looking at is pre-contact work because you're looking at obsidian work. Um, as a lot of us know, maybe some don't, obsidian is just simply natural glass. It's lava flows that come out of volcanoes and cool. And uh, so it's natural gl glass. It is razor sharp to the point where they actually, of course, they study everything and they used obsidian to cut a human cell where steel will rip through a human cell. Hmm. Obsidian is some of the sharpest material on the planet. Unfortunately, it's also some of the most fragile because it's simply glass. So there's, with that knowledge, back in the old days, the old timers were able to deduce, figure out the different types of obsidian for different purposes. Um, one carcass of a deer, I grew up a hunt and fishing kind of guy, out of one deer, I could make you dozens and dozens of different tools, implements, um, just multiple, multiple uses. And it goes for the same with um, obsidian. So what you're looking at, I believe, is gray obsidian, which is simply obsidian with more oxygen content in it. Hmm. So it's not as sharp as the pure black obsidian that you see, but it's stronger. And this, these items that you see are small. They're very uh, the size of uh, an iPhone, perhaps. And what they are is very elaborate. What we just always referred to in um, slang was money knives. These are just really fancy, valuable things. These are not everyday tools. These are not something that you would take hunting. These are not something that you'd use around the campfire. This is just a really elaborate, I've been in my roundhouse and it's been snowing for three months. That's what these are. Mm -hmm. So these are little gifts, little keepsakes, uh, maybe wedding gifts, things of that nature. And what you're looking at is one is elk antler with abalone inlay. And the abalone is simply seashell, as we know, abalone. Um, and it's set with pine pitch mixed with charcoal. Uh, scientists call it asphaltum. We just call it pitch. And the, uh, the charcoal acts as the hardener for the pine pitch. So that's how you make a waterproof glue. That's a traditional waterproof glue right there. Hmm. The rest of the material that is attaching the stone blade to the antler is sinew, that's backstrap. So that is the tendon that you would, everyone has it, it's what makes your arms and fingers move, your muscles flex. So the tendon on an elk or a deer goes down their backside and is very long. That's why they're able to run and jump so fast. And it's a whole different zoom, of course, but you have to process this, dry it, process it, remove it from the animal, harvest it, and then utilize it in combination with Hide glue. Hide glue is another product made from the same animal. It's boiling down his hide in order to make a glue. So now you've combined all these. And I try to give the short answer, believe it or not. This is the short answer. It's all right. Um, and you, you wind up with Indian fiberglass. And that's the examples of stone and the antler. Now what you're looking at is um, a little bit of pre and post contact, but we'll just speak about the post contact. So now you are seeing a little bit of old and the new, a little bit of the traditional culture still surviving, carrying on, the traditional art um, being mixed with European contact. So the two elaborate looking knives in the middle are made out of elk antler. Again, abalone inlay, which is traditional scrimshaw, which is that black design, those patterns that you see. And those are typically it's the same patterns over and over again. They're used in basketry. They're used in scrimshaw. And that's what we call a mountain design. Some people call it a quail. It, it just depends what valley you're from, what what neck of the woods you're from. And Jeremy, but, we should point out that the uh, the work is actually a sheath. So that knife, that's an actual uh, post-contact steel blade in the in the antler sheath on both of those knives so. correct that yeah that's exactly where we were going to get the uh, mesh of the old and the new mm -hmm. yeah that is the sheath and interior is a period 1860s blade 1870s blade i repurposed the old uh, reservation blades the old uh, railroad worker blades 
Mm. And you can still find them. Um, you find them in, believe it or not, junk drawers. You find them on the ranch. Um, people use them for hay knives and don't know what they have. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it's a metal blade with the traditional scrimshaw and antler, the, as you saw on the stonework previously. So now you've gone from an obsidian <laughs> blade to a steel blade. Um, Shantae, can we show the mannequin with the uh, necklaces? The very sure. Necklaces, and I think that's the one with the uh, mallard, mallard scalp belt. Yes, that's right. There it is, there she is. Kai and Jamie, you want to talk about that? Or? Okay, so this is um, a woman who's ready to dance in ceremony. Um, she, on top of her head, is wearing a patsuni, which is made from... Um, why am I drawing a blank right now? Thule core um, and wrapped with um, beaver hide fur, otter. <laughs> you know, I've looked at this, this piece many times in the last couple of days. Every time I see it, I see more, more to it. And I'm so sorry I don't have a close up photo of this. You have to see this in person, the, the detail. And what is, what is the headpiece called again? Patsuni. Patsuni. Uh, is just one of my favorites. It's just so magnificent. And I didn't realize all the materials that it took to create that. So. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, um, this um, was a first for me. And um, our girl happens to be a weaver. So she, her posts are wrapped with um, their willow wrap with sedru. We have um, clamshell disc beads on there and we have flicker flags and abalone dangles. Um, uh, I was taught how to make this by traditional teachers and uh, they instructed me that men are supposed to be the ones who do feather work. Um, so Kai made the flicker flags on the headpiece. Um, as far as her necklaces, they're all um, gathered in our area. Maybe some of, actually she has some mountain ash. So my people are from the valley. A um, couple of things would have been traded like the olivella. Um, she has some bayonet, which is more coastal. But could be higher up the hill. Um, but uh, the there's a necklace on her that has salmon vertebrae with acorn, and we gathered those by the river um, when the salmon died last fall. Um, just everything we were out we were out gathering around here and strung it up for her. Was there was there much trade uh, pre contact between tribes? Yes. Definitely. Is that a thing? Okay. Definitely. So those olivella shells are actually from Coast Pobo area. I mean, sure. that's how far it goes. Wow. Um, traditionally, or historically rather, many of the tribal people were quadlingual. So they spoke oh, quite a few different languages. And that's because the trade routes were so intricate. The abalone that she's wearing is from over on the coast. You know, you could not get abalone inland. Um, the clam shells are Washington sure. clams. Those are in California. Well, I mean, they're up in up in uh, Washington, of course. But the clamshell disc beads were generally made in the the lake valley and coast pomo areas once you get because we had it cold enough to where those clams would come in so the idea of this is she's the modern woman <laughs> she has on the trade routes of all of california you know the wrapping in the in the top part and i don't mean to take over jamie i'm sorry but you know no i appreciate 
the wrapping of the the her patsuni the the pegs coming out of the patsuni the wrapping of that is more of a northern technique the the flickers the orange flickers to the deep red are definitely a central california thing um the abalone the clam shells those things come from the coast she has a bit of you know all over california that has these trade routes that come through that make us uniquely california indians I love that. I love the I love the multilingual aspect too, because I mean I've heard that I mean the the distinct languages within the state of California among tribes was it was so diverse. It um, is. It's a, there's a Penutian, Athabascan, there's Hokan based languages. The very distinct languages. When, yeah. when I was little, I saw my grandma sitting with um, Marie Potts and with some of the Pomo weavers and the Pomos were, cause Valley Pomo and Lake Pomo are very different languages. And then when you add Coast Pomo in there, it's entirely different dialects. Every one of them was speaking their language except for my grandma. And she was answering them all in English. Oh, and wow. I said, how do you know what they're saying? <laughs> And she said, because we saw each other with my grandma, it was due to the boarding schools because she went to school with actually some of them. Mm. But with wow. the majority of the, the old ones here in California, the trade routes, you have to understand that every highway that you see in California is a trade route. You know, oh, they got trade oh, routes originally, right? Yeah, it goes, it goes that far back. Yeah. Yeah, it's the path of least resistance through yes. these hills. You know, the trade routes would be a natural way for the highways to go. But also, you're talking about one of the most populated states in the U.S. You know, they the, the histories say a million people. We know that to be untrue because there had to be at least 6 million Indians in California because of pre-contact pre pre yeah. because almost 80% of them died with all of the things that came with the, with contact with, no, the, disease with the diseases and, and everything. Yeah. And you still had an Indians left. So mm. the idea of that many populations, of course there was intermarriages. Of course there was trade routes, you know, for, for that to get to Shingle Springs, which if you look at some of the very first pictures, they are wearing whole abalone pieces. They are wearing mm. clamshell disc beads. Those beads traveled 400 miles. Wow. Regularly. And piggybacking on what Mia said, um, as far as the trade routes and um, modern highways being those, just think whenever you're on the bike trail and on the American River, that's the footpath between villages. Mm. So, um, and I also wanted to say about the about the trade routes too is, you know, most of the people who survived um, all the illness and you know colonizers happened to be the captains and their families. So happened to be some of the most wealthy people. So they were able to get more of that, those trade items and wear them around. So. The Yuba Sutter Arts actually sits within like a stone's throw of a village. Really? Well, cause, cause right where the Yuba and oh, the, the Sycamore, uh, Sycamore Ranch. Yeah. Well, I, I, like like right there where the Yuba River and the Feather River flow together, that was, that, that was the village of Yuba, which is well, uh, like it's the furthest south Konkawi village. And then right on the other side of the Yuba River is where Nisanon starts. But both of those, both Konkawi and Nisanon, are both Maidu dialects. So it's is that all okay? I always wonder how that works. Territory. Okay. So they are they are related. I was a little confused. Well, we have to talk to our neighbors. Well, uh, yeah. 
uh, we may need to call on you as consultants for a project. We want to do something. We don't know what it is, but to uh, to create more of a uh, presence um, in the community uh, to, I don't know what the word is, commemorate, memorialize, recognize, maybe is the word, um, Native American contribution to this place we call home. Um, and there's just nothing here. It's, you know, we're in contact with our local tribal community, the Estamumeka Maidu, of course, from Oroville originally, who, who now have property in South Yuba County, and that's where the Hard Rock Casino was built. Um, we have a wonderful American Indian Education Office here that's part of Marysville Joint Unified. So we've got some key players that can help, but with that kind of knowledge and information, we want to create something. And again, I don't know, I don't know that it needs to be a bronze statue. We're working on that for something else, but, uh, but something. Um, they had begun in one of our local parks, a uh, uh, the Sycamore Ranch uh, County Park. They had some bark houses uh, for a couple of years. They'd uh, they'd celebrate the return of the salmon. So there at least there were some ceremonial activities. But I want something more concrete that um, that can serve and, and be seen and visited and and learned from 365 days a year. So we'll continue to work on that. And now that we know each other, we'll call on you for good counsel. Shantae, where do we go from here? Wow, uh, I mean, the hour really just flew by here, but uh, I guess, uh, what should we end with here? Oh, well, don't, don't, don't end. end. No, not, not end, okay. <laughs> well, not end, well, I think we can run a little bit over time. Sure. Okay. Well, can I, I'm sorry, I asked, I invited you to participate, now I'm gonna interrupt you and say, right. there's one I wanna touch on, and I don't wanna go too deep into this forest if we don't want to, but, any thoughts on uh, your work um, in relation to uh, social or political issues? Can we, we do that, then we'll come back to a softer finish. Uh, any thoughts? Do you, do you feel that what you do has a, is there social commentary, political point of view, uh, apolitical, um, oh. none of the above? I don't know. What do you I think? I mean, of course, uh, simply by appearing in a digital format to the greater masses. Um, some of what we do isn't necessarily for any reason. It's simply art for art's sake, but it still maintains our presence in contemporary life. Like we don't and never did live in teepees and we are here and even Those though we, even though we maintain some as much as we can of our traditional practices we're still very much modern people i mean i drive a chevy we got mortgages you know like <laughs> we're, we're here but our but, but our art is something that you know uh, the beauty of art is in the eye of the beholder and so anybody that wants to beholden to it you know uh, so uh we both behold art and we are beholden to the art to uh, well, uplift it for that. the greater good of humankind well said yeah absolutely and and i think part of your point is you know and through that art there's an there is a, certainly a strong educational component uh, you know, rather than the homogenization of all native peoples. Of, of course. course, you all lived in, you, know, you all had uh, war bonnets and you lived in teepees. And yeah, I want one. <laughs> yeah, a lot, talk about a lot of work, right? I, I know, yeah. it just, it slays me. I mean, the, the lack of information people have about, you know, native cultures. So, mm, especially here it, in California. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, for, for a lot of it, is that if people are unaware, of native peoples it's not really their fault it is at a base level the american education system because if you admit that 90 percent of the population of a continent was decimated then you have to explain why yeah. and that's difficult for people to admit that it happened and it's really difficult to explain to a fourth grader it is True. Yeah, it's going to be age appropriate, but you got to start somewhere, yeah. right? There's there's a lot of that hidden history, and we're we're proud to have helped reveal one little story related to Japanese American treatment during uh, 
World War II, and we've now got a memorial park uh, in relation to that issue, uh, which is often also ignored in school. So, um, yeah, if anybody else want to weigh in on the educational or socio-political socio aspects of the work that you do? I, I agree. Uh, Kai said it very well. Um, by simply practicing and um, displaying our culture, being active within it, its resilience, its resistance, and it is uh, paying homage to um, the past and the present and providing for the future. So just by having this art show is a political statement that uh, we're still here and we're always going to be here. Here, here. Mm, beautiful. All right, Shante, back to you. To <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, kind of going off of that entire conversation here, um, what do you all hope that any viewers of the gallery show take away from the experience uh, that they'll have viewing your work? Um, for myself, it's I hope they take away the beauty of California Indian culture and how lucky we are to be in California and just how vibrant and beautiful and rich California Indian culture is, especially in the present and the past. I believe, obviously, as we were speaking in California, we've never had the great greatest press agent. When you see John Wayne, he's not in California, he's somewhere in the plains. See all these movies and uh, Long Ranger and all this media for the last, uh, you know, 80 to 100 years, um, for whatever reason, we're not out there on display. We're not... Um, interacted with. And I hope people take away just the richness of California Indian culture that we are diverse. We are all connected at the same time. Um, and not to take away from any of the artists out of state, but this is California Indian art for you. Beautiful. Very special, very unique. We're so blessed to have met you all. I'm so glad we uh, made the trip to Placerville to see your show. Uh, at uh, Art and Culture El Dorado and their beautiful galleries. So um, let me uh, remind everyone, uh, if you don't know, uh, we're going to have the great joy of welcoming these artists along with Shante Parks, who couldn't join us uh, today, another one of the exhibiting artists, on Saturday, September 11th, uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, we'll have an artist panel discussion. And then from 6 to 8, we'll actually have a reception here in the gallery. This is at our Gallery at Yuba Center Arts in Marysville. And, um, and we're going to have some uh, uh, native foods, I guess. Uh, uh, Mio has uh, suggested she might bring some acorn uh, meal uh, bread or, or cakes of some sort, something I've always wanted to try. And I know it's a process to leach those acorns and get them right. But, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll kick in some game meats and a few other things. It'll be a fabulous reception. The art, of course, and these people will be the uh, will be the centerpiece. So, um, Shante, anything else? Mio, yes, please. So I wanted to say that um, that we'll be tabling there, and we will hopefully all have stuff for sale. Um, I'll be bringing some of my prints. I wanted to let people know where they can find me. Also, I'm on please. Facebook and Instagram. Uh, my handle is Mio Marufo on both. Nothing fancy, no shy girl at so and so river.com or anything like that. Just Mio Marufo. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. I post all of my finger doodles. Um, that doesn't mean that I want you to take them and copy them. It means that I post them. It's kind of my way of paying it forward to the people who follow me. Um, there's several artists that are online that post their work. Jeremy is one of them um, that we like to share what we're doing and just to kind of pay it forward to people. But Mio Marufo, Instagram, Facebook, a couple of selfies mixed in there, maybe some yeah. food, maybe. Some <laughs> but yeah, I'll be bringing my prints and my cards to the September 11th. Um, I also wanted to say for everybody that's going through the fires out there, if, you know, stay safe out there. And, you know, we here in Pomo country went through this two years ago. We are feeling for you guys now. 
and stay safe and know that our prayers and our thoughts are with you. Pray for rain. Well, yes. Yes, thank you, Mio. If anyone out there uh, needs help contacting uh, Mio or any of the other artists, uh, let us know. We can certainly put you in touch. All right. On that note, I think we'll uh, wrap up again. Uh, uh, big gratitude, Sigrid. Thank you so much for all your help and guidance on this project. Shante, doing what you do so consistently. And Mio, really appreciate it. Kai, Jamie, Jeremy, thank you all. Can't wait to see you all here on September 11th. Keep in touch and we'll, uh, we'll see you then. And thank you to David, Shante, Mio, Sigrid, Jeremy for bringing us along. Thank you. Thank you yeah, for having me. Yeah, thank you for me. everyone at YSA for putting this together and all of the investment in this show. It's um, really been wonderful to work with all of you. And you know, on behalf of the incubator, we just really want to thank you for your kind enthusiasm. Our pleasure. All right, see you soon. Good night. Thank you for having me. Good night, Roboto.